and to pray. So I'm just going to do what the only thing I know how to do is open God's word with you this morning and um, have you turn to Daniel chapter 8. And we'll look at this for a few minutes. If that's all right. If you need a Bible, our ushers are here in the aisles. Bon and I were listening to a guy this morning, and here's, here's what's troubling to me about where the church is at these days. The entire time we were listening to him, he never once read a verse. He never once read scripture. He talked about his opinion and gave us his wisdom. And I just want to agree with you this morning, that's not why you've gotten up to come here. You haven't come to hear from me. And, and I don't even like mentioning too much about my mom because it just sounds like everything revolves around me and my narcissism. And, and uh, I want all of this to revolve around Jesus. Mom's with the Lord. That's what matters. And I want you to be with the Lord too when it's all said and done. And, and uh, so it's not my words that are promised to not return void. It's his word. So I'm going to read his word to you this morning. And just let it soak into the very pores and and essence and fiber of your soul. And uh, in doing so, I pray that it would just bring you great comfort this morning. Great comfort primarily in knowing that God has a plan. That he's on the throne. That he's in control. And as Chuck would teach us early on, a lot of us grew up at Costa Mesa together. We were probably sitting on the shag carpet together. Hadn't met yet, but we were sitting there on the carpet together. Hipsters. And uh, Chuck would say, history is his story. And and Daniel chapter 8 is one of the most amazing passages here pertaining to history that is being proclaimed, that is being prophesied before it took place. Hundreds of years Before any of this goes into motion, God would uh, cross the T's and and dot the I's and lay things out for Daniel. And then he would say this, Daniel, it's not for you. So tuck it up on a shelf and seal it away because it's for the end times believers like in 2024. More than it's for you, Daniel. It's, it's meant to encourage you and to inspire you, but it's really meant to instill in them a faith that supersedes their fear. Like all that the Lord is going to reveal now in these verses, He chooses to reveal. And if you've never been into to biblical prophecy or, or, or end times events, He reveals how it's going to end to relieve you of your fears. So let that play out in your heart and in your life this morning. Okay, Daniel 8, you got it? In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared to me, to me, Daniel, After the one that appeared to me the first time, and I saw the vision, it happened while I was looking that I was in Shushan, the citadel, and in the province of Elam, and I I saw in the vision, as I was by the river, uh, Uli, and and you're like, wow, well, he's just really specifically detailed in wanting you to know where he was. When all this went down, he lifted up my eyes and I saw, and there standing beside the river was a ram, which had two horns. Nothing all that odd about that. You see it in Borrego, bouncing around on the rocks. You can, but this one's different. It had two horns, and, and one of the horns was high, so long, taller than the other one. One was higher than the other. And, 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 and the higher one came up last. And so this is, I'll prove it to you, a reference now in this vision that Daniel receives of an empire that's going to come and wipe out Belshazzar's empire, the one who has now taken the place of Nebuchadnezzar. It is still in the reign and realm and empire rule. 
and domination of Babylon when, 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 when Daniel receives this vision. But this ram comes on the scene with two horns. One's, one's longer than the other ones. You get this Medo-Persian thing going on. And ultimately the Persians are even going to wipe out that, that, that shorter horn and really just kind of take it all over. But it hasn't happened yet and everyone's just kind of looking like, no, who in the world could ever come along and replace Babylon? I mean, they, they were it. And yet here's the vision. And a lot of liberal commentators and a lot of liberal theologians want to somehow convince you that, that somehow Daniel was written after the fact. It wasn't. He tells us when it was written and where he was and, and who was sitting on the throne. King Belshazzar, the king of Babylon, is still ruling and in control. Okay, so this is very huge, hugely important. And, and and, and, and so no one saw it coming, and yet here comes this ram. And uh, push, I saw the ram, verse 4, pushing westward and northward and southward. It's taking over. No animal could withstand him. Nor was there any who could deliver from his hand. But he did according to his will, and he became great. So there goes Babylon, and in comes the Medo-Persian Empire, and ultimately the Medes disappear and are left with a few relics in the museum, but for the most part becomes the Persians, which are the longer of those two horns on the ram. And, and as I was considering this, he's just sort of like, wow, this is amazing. And um, great for us to be able to know that we're worshiping a God who sees tomorrow as clearly as we see today, although my eyes are blurry. He sees it clear, clearer than, 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 than crystal. He does. And so he's thinking, wow, this is, this is amazing. And the, and the Lord's like, sort of like this in the vision. He's like, you haven't seen anything yet. Look at verse 5. Look at verse 5. As I was considering this, suddenly a male goat came from the west. And so, uh, okay, here we go. It's playoff weekend. Praise the Lord we don't live in Buffalo. <laughs> and none of y'all had to like shovel out to get here this morning. Come on, praise God. Amen? But it's playoff weekend. Okay. And I think the Rams play today. And uh, so here you got it. You got the, this is playoff, Daniel 8, playoff weekend. Where, where the end of the world, it was just like, this is the Rams against the goats. And here you got this male goat, verse 5, comes on the scene, it's going to wipe out the Rams. Male goat came from the west, didn't come from the east, didn't come from China, doesn't come from India. It sails from the west. We had a map up there on the screen. You could be able to see the Medo-Persian Empire right there hovering around where modern-day Iraq would be, where, where, where Babylon would be. And now from the west is this move of this goat, of this male goat coming across the surface of the whole earth without touching the ground. And the goat had a notable horn between its eyes. And so that's kind of fascinating. It's almost like a unicorn goat. It's the goat. And he came to the ram, verse 6, that had two horns, uh, which I had seen standing beside the river, and, and, and ran at him with furious power. So there's your National Geographic, right, History Channel. These two are just sort of like... He's snorting, right? And it's just like, just like this big, dusty smash of a crash, this furious power. And I saw him, verse 7, confronting the ram. And he was moved by the rage against him. And he attacked the ram and he broke its horns. And there was no power in the ram to withstand him. So as powerful as the ram was to wipe out Babylon and replace Belshazzar, who's on the throne in chapter 8, as powerful as the ram was, now the ram has met its match. Wipes it out. Broke its horns. There was no power in the ram to withstand him, but, 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 but he cast him down to the ground, trampled him, and there was no one that could deliver the ram from his hand. Therefore, the male goat grew very strong. But when he became strong, a large horn was broken, and in place of it, four notable ones came up toward the four winds of heaven. Hold on. 
Hold on, because this is going to happen to every single world empire, including America. They crumble into dust. And as great as the goat was, and it's not Tom Brady, as great as the goat was, and it's not Michael Jordan, as great as the goat was, the goat isn't even Gretzky. The goat is Greece. And the ram is the Medo-Persian Empire, and they both crumble. And, 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 and here is the lesson of the morning, that anything other than the Lord and his kingdom that you're resting and relying upon and trusting in with your heart will crumble to dust. This one as well. It begins to break into pieces. And now you got four notable ones that replace the great unicorn horn of the goat, which is Greece. And now you got division. And now you got competing rivalries. And the four notable ones came up towards the four winds of heaven. And out of one of them, came a little horn. Now, this is where it gets very, very intriguing, very fascinating. Hold on, buckle up. Here comes the, the, the picture and foreshadowing of the one who will come on the scene. Out of this Greco-Roman world captivating empire known as the Antichrist. It's all picturing more for Daniel towards what life is going to be like in our day and age than in his. And so this one, this one little horn in verse 9, grew exceedingly great towards the south and towards the east and towards the glorious land. And that is in Rancho Santa Fe. Or America. It's Israel. Everything around the world, even now in the news, is revolving around a sliver of land smaller than New Jersey. Because it's captivated God's heart. And it's his glorious land. And this knucklehead of one of the so-called four notable ones that emerge out of the reign of Greece now begins to wickedly, ferociously reign and rule in his region, primarily in Israel. And it grew up to the host of heaven and and it cast down some of the host, verse 10 declares. He's going to wreak havoc on God's people and and everything that is is righteous and holy, he, he, he will oppose. Cast down some of the host and some of the stars to the ground and he trampled them. Verse 11, he even exalted himself as high as the prince of the host. Now he isn't that high, but he tries. It's what ultimately gets Lucifer kicked out of heaven. I will exalt myself. And... um, Here that same spirit is being seen and depicted and prophetically declared to Daniel as something to keep an eye out for, to to, to watch and not get sucked into or affected in any way by. He even exalted himself as high as the prince of the host. I think ultimately at the end of the chapter, When Daniel says he's sick, that's what he's sick of. And that should be our response. Just absolutely sick, like almost too sick to get out of bed, but I'm glad you did this morning. Because of what's happening in our society, of what's happening in our culture, of the demonic turn of events, how quickly things have spiraled out of control. And that's what is being spoken of here in Daniel chapter 8. I mean, it gets so intense that he then ultimately takes the daily sacrifices away from the entire intent and purpose of Israel then returning 
from captivity in Babylon back to Israel and they rebuild the temple and thanks to Nehemiah they rebuild the walls miraculously in 52 days. All for what? For, 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 for this numbskull, this wing not to come in and, 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 and now to just cast it all down. The daily sacrifices thrown out. Look at cast truth down to the ground. That's ultimately what leaves Daniel in this sickened state at the end of chapter 8. He did all this, it says at the end of verse 12, and prospered. There's going to there's be a season. Don't, don't let it derail you. There's going to be a season where it seems like the enemy is succeeding. It's a time in Scripture where we're, where we're told that, that, that sin is pleasurable for a season. I got my outline for tonight. There it is, guys. I'm talking about lust tonight. Bond's talking about sex. Not just sex, sweet sex. Sweet! <laughs> Sexy sex. And, and how much the enemy is choosing to take and pervert and twist what God has ordained and intended to be holy. So we're going to look, guys, we're going to look at the purpose and the process and the psalmist and the pursuit and the promise of no longer being prey to the lies of lust. This is one of the ways in which the enemy in our day and age right now is trying to take believers out. And ultimately, he's like this. He's like, he's, he's prospering at it. And that just made Daniel sick. And then I heard a holy one speaking in verse 13. Another holy one said to a certain one who was speaking, how long? And that's exactly what our, how long? I mean, how Lord, really, sir, how long? You're going to let this go on. The psalmist declares that. How long will the vision be concerning the daily sacrifice, the transgression of desolation, and giving both the sanctuary and the host to be trampled underfoot? He said to me, for 2,300 days. In other words, his days are numbered. And it might seem for a while and for a season, we're kind of living in the soup of it right now. But his days are numbered. And, and here those days are given 2,300 days, and then the sanctuary will be cleansed. And so it happened when I, Daniel, had seen the vision and was seeking the meaning, and suddenly there stood before me one having the appearance of a man. And, and, and I heard the man's voice between the banks of the Uli. And, and he called and he said, Gabriel, help this guy out. Gabriel. I think this is the Lord Jesus Christ. This is one of those uh, pre-incarnate appearances of the Lord Jesus Christ in Scripture. Long before he shows up as a baby in a manger in Bethlehem. It's the incarnation of God. Right? You know that term? It's the incarnation of God. Where do we get our term today from? You know where? Carne asada. Chili con carne. What's that? Chili with meat. Carne asada. This is, this is God. Here's the incarnation. God who is spirit, who is invisible. God who says to Moses, you can't see me. Moses is like, I want to see you. God's like, you can't. It'll kill you. So let me I'll just like hide you in the cleft of the rock here and, 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 and I'll pass by. You'll see a little bit of my glory and that's going to be enough. Momo, that'll be enough to light you up for months. Any more than that's going to wipe you out. So this, this God who's invisible, this, this God who's so holy that we, we can't approach, put skin on, put meat on. The incarnation is God in the flesh. And prior to him being born in Bethlehem, there are these pre-incarnate times in which he appears like to Joshua as the commander of the Lord's army before Joshua leads the Israelites out of the wilderness and across the Jordan into the promised land. Jesus meets with them there or, or with Gideon. When Gideon's freaking out as he's threshing the wheat. Not where you're supposed to, which would be up on top of a mountain so that the wind could separate. He's threshing the wheat in a wine press. He's freaked out, scared to death. Now listen, this is why God's revealing truth to you this morning. 
where the world is concerned that it would relieve you of the fear and so hear the Lord Jesus Christ in a pre-incarnate visitation relieves Gideon and calls him a mighty man of valor. He does so with Abraham. And Abraham fixes him a nice meal as the Lord Jesus would then declare to Abraham what's going to happen to Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abe's like this in good Jewish perspectives. Abraham says, well, will you, will you, will you, will you spare it for 40? The Lord says, yeah, I'll spare those cities for 40. 40 righteous in those cities, those right. Will you spare it for 30? Yeah, I'll spare it for 30. For, will you give me 20? And uh, here yet now once again, the Lord shows up to relieve any fear of Daniel in any way thinking somehow that worldliness, domination ultimately of satanic possession is going to win in the end because it's not. You just need to know that. And we're here as a church to come alongside you and your family and help to instruct your kids and your grandkids to know the truth where the Lord is concerned, where history is concerned. And so here the Lord shows up and he's like, Gabe, Gabe, hey, make yourself useful here and help the guy to understand the vision. And so verse 17, he came near where I stood and he came and I was afraid. I fell on my face. He said to me, hey, understand, hey, hey, hey. It's exactly the response, you know, when John in the book of Revelation falls on his face and the angel says, hey, don't be bowing down and worshiping me. You worship one name, that's the name of Jesus. Get up, we got things to do. He dusts him off and props him up and here the same occurs. The same takes place. Hey, I need you to understand this. Uh, the boss has come and he's told me to help you understand. You need to understand this, son of man, that the vision refers to the time of the end. Okay, some of you thought I was making that up. It doesn't have anything to do with Daniel as much as it has to do with you and me. Now, as he was speaking, verse 18, I was in a deep sleep and my face was to the ground and he touched me and he, and, 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 and he stood me upright. He goes, oh, come on, we've got a job to do. The job's not done. And he said, look, Verse 19, I am making known to you what will happen in the latter time of the indignation, for at the appointed time at the end shall be. And now you know. Uh, You're getting your mail early. It's letting you know what's up. And here's what's up. Prove it to you. Verse 20, the ram which you saw having the two horns, that's the kings of Media and Persia. They're going to ultimately move in, wipe out Babylon, and take the place on the throne as the world empire. And the male goat, not Brady, the male goat is the kingdom of Greece. The large horn that's between its eyes, it's the first king, that's Alexander the Great, of the kingdom of Greece that wipes out the Medo-Persian empire and becomes the dumb, you're like, Bob, come on, seriously, like why? I mean, Let's just get to the pancakes because, I mean, like, America's not even mentioned in end times prophecy, and yet the Medes and the Persians are? Why would God care more about the Medes and the Persians than he does us, good old Americans? Well, maybe because it's through the Medes and the Persians that Israel is then released from captivity in Babylon and allowed to return to Israel so that the temple can be restored, so the people can return, so that ultimately the Messiah can come. Hello. Well, why Why does he care about Greece? Uh, hold on a sec, wait a minute. What is that language again that the entire New Testament is written in? Oh yeah, it's Greek. Which would then, according to the book of Acts, allow evangelism to spread like a wildfire through the modern known world of the time through the Greek language. In fact, even when the Romans step in and replace Greece as the empire, they keep the same language. Have you been to Greece? If you go to Greece, you go to Athens, you, 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 go, to, you, you, you go to Santorini. I, I, I've been there many times, love it. We've taken many trips from the 
from the church, cruises. And when you're sailing around the Greek islands, you are sailing in the Aegean Sea, right? How's that for public school? I remember that. I mean, I'm running a school now that I couldn't even get into myself. But I remember that the sea surrounding Greece is called the Aegean Sea. Do you know what Aegean means? Some of you are Googling right now. I just didn't know. <laughs> Aegean means goat. The Sea of the Goat. The Goat Sea. The Aegean Sea. All coming directly at you this morning from Daniel chapter 8. Because of this vision that God gives to Daniel, all of the waters pertaining to Greece territory is known as the Aegean Goat waters the goat sea the aegean sea this kingdom of greece this alexander the great and then it's broken the horn is broken he didn't have any kids he didn't have any sons and the generals step in four generals in particular the four that stood up in its place four kingdoms will arise out of that nation but not with its power in the latter time of their kingdom when the transgressors have reached their fullness a king will arise having fierce features who understands sinister schemes enter antichrist his power will be mighty not of his own power it's demonic he shall destroy fearfully and prosper and thrive and will destroy the mighty and also the holy people he's going to wipe everything out that he possibly can wipe out during that period known as the Great Tribulation. And through his cunning, he will cause deceit to prosper under his rule. And he will exalt himself in his heart. That's what Lucifer does. He exalts himself. Isaiah speaks of it. I will exalt myself. You know what? This is just like amazing. This is just like so clear. He'll destroy many in their prosperity and shall even rise against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without human means. God will take care of him. It's not going to be our nukes or our missiles or NATO that takes care. It's going to be the Lord God Almighty that takes care of him. God's going to take care of him. And the vision of the evenings and the mornings which was told is true. I just want you to know that there. Verse 26, it's, it's, it's true. You can take it to the bank. You can, bank. you can trust your life to it. All other ground is, is sinking sand. Listen, church, this morning you got to know something. There's only one thing that's perfect on this planet, and it ain't me. And it's not you. And it's not our marriage. It's not our church. You're, you're looking for a perfect church? It was before you came. None of us are perfect. We're all sinners. There's one thing on the planet that's perfect. What is it? It's the Word of God. The Word. The Word that was with God. The Word that was God. The Word of God is perfect. And if we're not abiding our life by the perfect Word of God, we're wrong. It's not wrong. It's never wrong. And here Daniel just goes to some incredible lengths of just wanting to say this. Don't be blowing this off or yawning this uh, into into some category of of, of, of boredom. The the vision of the evenings of which was told is true. Therefore, seal up the vision for it refers to many days in the future. For, For you and for me, for us. And so then I, last verse, Daniel, fainted, sick for days. And not because of the goat, and not because of the ram, and not because of Gabriel. He's not even like overly impressed with the fact that Gabriel, the archangel, has has been with him and and dusted him off. And and no, he's, he's sick of the satanic intent and strategies to go against the kingdom of God and his people. It's got him throwing up. Hard to get out of bed. 
and in some ways it was the hardest birthday ever. You know, it was my golden year birthday. You can have your golden birthday, that means that you're the age of your, like January 11 when I was 11, right? That's your, but your golden year, am I making this up? The golden year is when you turn the age of the year you were born. So I was born in 62, and so this was my golden year. And, uh, and to get that news, it's like, and yet at the same time to know where she is, and, and, uh, and mom's like, don't worry about me. She's happy and she's healed and, and uh, she's having her best day ever. And so, yeah, he, he, he feels faint, he feels sick. And so did David, right, over the consequence of his sins because of his lustfulness. Tonight, guys, we'll look at that together. What are the steps of David's downfall? But ultimately, then, after his mourning and after his sickness, both with David and with Daniel, as well as with yours truly, and with my kids, and with my sister Betsy, who was such an incredible, faithful saint to be there with my mom. He says this, look what Daniel says, afterwards I arose and I went about the king's business. I was astonished by the vision. No one understood it. But I hope and pray with all my heart we would understand it this morning. We, we would get this. We would see the lengths that God has gone to through the spoken word of his truth to reveal to us how things will end in the end. And that it would just sort of like be for us and for our kids a, a, a wake-up call out of what so oftentimes the enemy is using to sort of distract us and, and, and lure us away and, and, and somehow end up causing us to, to justify in our own self-righteousness that there are things more important in my life and, and, and in my world than the things of the Lord. Lewis puts it this way. Lewis Lewis is amazing, and again, he gives us a great quote this morning and says, you and I have need of the strongest spell, and let it be Daniel 8 that would come upon your heart this morning. You and I need, need of the strongest spell that could be found to wake us. Hey, that's, that's, that's the Lord Jesus instructing Gabriel to come alongside Daniel and say, hey, hey. To wake us from the evil enchantment of worldliness. So it's playoff weekend. And ultimately, here you see this one historically to which God is setting Daniel up into a place of both wisdom and discernment to be able to understand the days and to understand the times and that's exactly what Jesus says to us we don't know the day or the hour of his return but we can look around and we can see what season we're in and my goodness gracious oh my stars it's like this spirit of antichrist is looming and for Daniel it was in the appearance of Antiochus Epiphanes who becomes that general underneath the realm of Alexander the Great who just wreaks havoc in destroying the temple and desecrating it, actually takes a pig in and slaughters it on the altar after Israel has been released from Babylon and returns, returns to Jerusalem. This Antiochus Epiphanes, you know what that means? I am God. That's what he names himself. That's the title he gives him. Manifest God. Antiochus Epiphanes. And he goes in and he desecrates the temple. And that's why the response here is, well, how long? How long are we going to have to live under the reign and the rule and the spirit of this Antichrist. And that's what John says in, John, in 1 John chapter 2. He's like, there are many Antichrists. But it is all leading up to there being one Antichrist who will come on the scene and in the same manner and fashion repeat. I mean, the devil really isn't all that creative. 
repeat exactly the antics of Antiochus Epiphanes, who everyone called Antiochus Epimenes, which means you're a crazy nut. And it all foreshadows Antichrist. We've kind of had that same spirit, it seems to me, in in every culture, whether it's Caesar or whether it's Antiochus, the days of Daniel and, 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 and all that he lived to desecrate for Israel. Maccabees, first and second Maccabees speaks about it so well, those historical books. They're bad Bible, but they're good history. They give to you all, all, connecting all the dots, that that ultimately in John chapter 10, when Jesus shows up at the temple, in John 10, he shows up for the Feast of Dedication. What's that? What's the Feast of Dedication? I mean, we know what the Feast of First Fruits is. We know what the Feast of Unleavened Bread is. We know what the Feast of Passover is. What's the Feast of Dedication? It's the fact that Antiochus Epiphanes had desecrated the temple for so long but then ultimately it gets restored and ultimately gets dedicated and ultimately the lights in the temple go back on. That's Hanukkah. And Jesus goes to celebrate that in John chapter 10 at the Feast of Dedication. And all of that for you and I, according to Daniel, has more to do with us than it had to do with them because it is... It it, it is all foreshadowing of, again, an antichrist who will walk into that temple having duped Israel into thinking that he is their big answer to peace, and the whole world for that matter. He's going to come on the scene with that same Antiochus Epiphanes spirit of, of pride, and I will exalt myself, and I will manifest myself to the to the highest of heights. I will be God. And, he, and, he, and ultimately, Antichrist requires everyone to bow down and to take the mark and to worship him. And, and don't be duped. Don't fall for any of that. And teach your kids. Sit down with them and say, you know, this is what the Bible declares and there's nothing perfect on the planet except God's word. Heaven and earth are going to pass away. But my word will never pass away. So here he's crossing the T's. And here he's dotting the I's for us. And whether it's been... Antiochus, or whether it's been Caesar, or whether it's been Lenin, or whether it's been Stalin, or whether it's been Biden, or whether it's been Gavin, I'm just going with names that rhyme. (laughs) There is this spirit of Antichrist that is anti-God. And our go-to along with Daniel is to be about the king's business. To stand strong for him. To know that ultimately in the end it's not the Medes and the Persians and it's not the Greeks and it's not the Romans and it's not even Pax Americana which is folding in on itself by the minute. It's going to be the kingdom of our God. And I so very much want for that to be the team that you're on. And you got this host of heaven along with my mom and Billy and Chuck that's cheering you to the finish line. So what would it take for you to be all in? In 2024. Because everything absolutely to the T where this prophecy written hundreds of years before any of it went into motion has all been proved to be absolutely spot on, pinpoint accurate. Well, I think I would need a few more of those. Okay, how many more? You want 50 more? You want 50 more Daniel 8s before you're all in and you believe this to be perfect? Well, your 50 would be good because there's a heck of a lot more than 50. Well, how about 100? You're going to be like Abraham? You're going to like, well, you... How about 200? How about 200 prophetic promises that with pinpoint accuracy have actually been fulfilled? How about 500? Would that be enough? How about you double that? How about 1,000? No, no, no. I, that's, that, would probably, I don't know, that would be asking maybe a little too. It can't be a thing. How about 2,000? Because there's over 2,000 that have already been prophetically promised and fulfilled. 
How about 2,500? How about you go all in? How about you entirely with your family and with your marriage decide this morning that what we declared last weekend is exactly how you need to live 24-7 in 2024 to the glory and honor of his name. And that together we would warn those whom the Lord would graciously allow us to cross paths with, whether it's in the produce aisle at Vons or whether it's in line at Starbucks, we would, we would look to live to help prepare as God's word through Daniel chapter 8 has looked to live in our life this morning to help us be prepared. In fact, let me just quickly give you a list. How about this? What if we, what if we live to warn and live to be wary of, 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 of the, the dupes and the tricks and the strategies that the devil is going to be pulling out of his bag in these last days, knowing that his time is short, Jesus says, don't be deceived. Many are going to come in my name, pull off all sorts of stunts and miraculous tricks. Be wary of those things and have your face buried in the book of truth, the perfect word of God. Warning those Wary of the strategies of worldliness, as Lewis has said, and, and, and witnessing. You're like, well, I'm, really, but I'm not really much of a witness, or I don't even know what I would say. Well, you've got the wonderful evidence to share with people. You're like, well, what is that wonderful evidence? I'm not sure I remember this morning. I'm a bit groggy, too. You have an empty tomb. Just go with that. Because as much as you might want to be buying into Poca Honda, Rama Honda, Giga Nama Guga Giga Swami guy, he's in the grave. And our God isn't. He's conquered our sin and he's risen from the dead. And the wonderful evidence that you have is that we're not here this morning worshiping a dead guy. He's alive and in control and ruling and reigning on the throne. And how about this? How about Waiting over where I get too many Christians right now that are all wrapped up in worry, basing all their hope on an election. Well, let me just remind you, God ain't running this year. So place your waiting on him over worry. Wait on the Lord. Those that wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. There's some moms in the room right now that need a good dose of some strength they that wait upon the Lord will renew their strength what do waiters do waiters serve you look for a way to come alongside a church such as this and serve the Lord and you will find yourself supernaturally being strengthened get your eyes off yourself and all of the worldliness that wants to suck us in and you just wait on the Lord. Put waiting on the Lord over worrying. He hasn't given you a spirit of fear, of power and of love and of a sound mind. And how about this? What he's written, he's written. So like get into it. Get into the study of the book of Acts. That's the smartest thing Pilate ever said. What I've written, I've written. And the Lord echoes that and says, Know what I say. You can't know God's will without knowing God's word. And what he's written, he's written for you. And what he's written, he's written for me to relieve us of our fears. To reveal to us, ultimately in the end, how it goes down. We need to become more in touch with where mom is right now than where she spent the last 87 years. Are you hearing me? Lewis puts it this way, he says, maybe what matters the most is what we understand the least. And so perhaps the best is what we would go for together this year, to know him. Paul says to know him and the power of his resurrection. Because what he has written, he has written with pinpoint prophetic accuracy over 2,500 times to win you over. 
and you'd give him your heart. And you'd plant your flag and stake your claim and say, I'm all in for Jesus Christ because he is worthy of our praise. Come on, let's stand together, church. And Lord, this morning, knowing Jesus, you are God. Jesus, you are alive. Jesus, you win. Jesus, you are on the throne. And so may we just stand in recognition and declare this year, we're going with God's word. We're trusting in Jesus. He's worthy of all honor, of all glory, and of all praise. And we we worship you. We, We give you our hearts. We cling to that old rugged cross. For there I will ever be true. It's shame and reproach gladly bear and He'll call me someday to my home far away where His glory forever I'll share. All my life you've been faithful, Lord. Faithful you will be to the end. And so with every breath, with every step, with every intent of our heart, Lord, may we live to give you praise and until our name is called and our days are up and our bell is rung, our, our number. I, I know how it will end for me. My kids will unplug my life support to charge their phone. And that'll be it. And until then, would you help me to live for Jesus? Keep my eyes fixed on him. The glory and honor and praise to know him. Church, we're so blessed. Let's sing together. Worthy is his name.